So as far as gaining access is concerned, our first stop is going to be password cracking. Password cracking is how we basically log into somebody else's account on a remote system. If we can do this successfully, it's going to give us unauthorized access to the system. And the easiest way to get in is by getting lots and lots of user accounts and then trying guessable passwords. A lot of times the season, the year, um, sometimes the company name, exclamation mark, the year uh, or season in the year. And again, if we can find just one account that'll let us in, that's all that we need for now. We don't need to crack every single account in the organization, just one. Hopefully it's one that's gonna give us access like Remote Access VPN. So when we look at the types of password attacks that are available, um, we can start off here with non-electronic attacks. You don't necessarily have to be a computer hacker. You don't have to have hardware key loggers. You don't have to have crazy JavaScript. Maybe you can just look over somebody's shoulder. The process of looking over their shoulder and watching them type in their credentials is shoulder surfing. The process of going through somebody's trash and just looking and seeing maybe they wrote down a password on a post-it note, well, that's referred to as dumpster diving. And then social engineering is where we con them out of giving us their password. Or maybe we can con them into changing their password to something we control. Like, hey, this is Ryan from the network team. We're going to be making some changes with the Active Directory Domain Controller. It's going to um, basically lead to some authentication issues. We're going to have to move everybody over to a temporary server just for the afternoon. So if you can set your password to temp2018 exclamation mark, one, two, three, just use this for this afternoon. Don't tell it to anybody. And at the end of the day, change it to something else. And again, don't write it down. Don't tell it to anybody. But we're going to need you to use temp2018 exclamation one, two, three for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, we'll send you a link over so that you know where to change it. And then you can use that same link in the afternoon to change it back. Again, you just create a story like that just to con somebody into changing it into a password under your control. Um, <clears throat> moving over towards electronic attacks, you've got what's called active online versus passive online. Let's start with passive. You know, with passive, we could sniff the packets as they're going across the wire. And a lot of web applications, a lot of applications are web applications, which means if we perform wire sniffing and that application sends a cookie across the wire inside of an HTTP header, that cookie is basically their authentication token. So if I can capture or steal that cookie, I can authenticate as though I'm that particular user. Um, a lot of times wire sniffing doesn't work that good these days because we use switches. So to get traffic to actually come to us and come through us, we've got to manipulate the network. And the process of doing that is called man in the middle attacks. We can do things like ARP poisoning. We can do things like route injection to protocols such as OSPF. Um, you can do gateway hijacking. You can hijack spanning tree protocol. The list is really endless. There's lots and lots of network protocols. A lot of them don't use authentication of any kind. And even though there are protection mechanisms that can be enabled, a lot of people don't bother to turn them on. So man in the middle, once you learn to do this, very, very effective way to steal other people's credentials, as well as insert malicious content like a backdoor or uh, a Trojan horse into software that they're actually trying to download. If we can get traffic to come through us, we can actually perform injection into binaries as they pass by. So we'll talk more about this later this week when we get into sniffing. <clears throat> really its own section, but a very effective way to steal credentials, either cookies or doing things like man in the middle attacks where you actually steal the password. Um, active online attacks, this is where you'll use a piece of software that'll do automated login attempts. So you could use, within Metasploit framework, they have auxiliary modules those auxiliary modules allow you to do certain things like authenticate to a Telnet, SSH, or RDP server. So I could do automated login attacks just using Metasploit. Um, other than that, there's utilities like Hydra uh, that can be used for doing online attacks as well. All you'll do is point to an IP address of a remote server, specify the protocol that you're going to use like HTTP, Telnet, FTP, and then you can use a word list. You'll just try every single word in the username list and the password list to try to break in. Um, <clears throat> again, this tends to be very slow 
because you're building a th that three-way handshake. You're connecting to the service. You're waiting for an authentication prompt. It authenticates you. You try to authenticate. It thinks for a second, then it rejects you. This is slow. This is noisy because each of your failed attempts are going to show up in a log file. But it's something that's still possible. It's something that's good to test to understand how it works, um, you know, just in a situation where you might want to try to do this. Um, what's going to be a little bit faster and stealthier, and we like stealth, is what we call on offline attacks. Offline attack is where the attacker, that consider that stuff to be you or I, um, copies the target's password file and then tries to crack passwords in his own system at a different location. What's this deal with the password file? Well, if you store passwords, create a user account, <clears throat> go ahead and set up a password with it, the operating system takes the password and it forms a hash of it. And a hash is also known as a digest. So for example, one common hashing, hashing algorithm that we've been seeing forever is MD5. So, Technically, as of 2008 and higher, we should be using SHA-2 as a hashing algorithm, but a lot of people still use MD5. It's 128-bit hashing system, and what you basically do is take some type of input, which would be your password, you run it through a hashing algorithm like MD5, and it creates a digest or output. And then every time you authenticate, you say, my username is Ryan, my password's Stormwind123. It takes Stormwind123, runs it through a hashing algorithm, and creates a digest. And then it's, it compares that digest that we just created to the stored digest on the system. In other words, to keep your password secure, it doesn't store the password in clear text. It stores a hash. So every time we authenticate, it runs through a hashing algorithm, makes a comparison. That said, if you can compromise a remote system and access the password file, it'd be Etsy Shadow in Linux it would just be what we call the SAM file, Security Account Manager, in Windows. If we can access that file and dump the credentials, this requires root privileges to do or administrative rights. But if you can touch that SAM file, you can get all the stored passwords. If you've got those stored passwords, you can try to crack them locally. What's nice about that is you just run lots of different inputs as a password through a hashing algorithm, and then you compare it to what's in that shadow file. Nice thing about that is we can leverage graphics processors. So if you've got like an NVIDIA 1080, you can grind out billions of MD5 password attempts every second. It just goes through tons and tons and tons and tons of space. That's what makes this very fast and it's what makes it stealthy. The downside is that there's a prerequisite to doing these. We've got to have hashes. So you can either capture it from a SAM file or <clears throat> kind of coming back over to these online attacks, just because you're wire sniffing doesn't mean you're going to get anybody's password. Sometimes the password doesn't cross the wire in the clear. Sometimes they use what's called challenge handshake authentication protocols. Like you could use MD5 chap. And what happens there is you have a client in the server, client connects to the server to authenticate, and the server sends a challenge across. So it's just like a random string. You take that random string and you take your password, you run it through a digest like MD5 or SHA-2, and then you come up with the result. So that's the challenge and the response. If you've got the ability to sniff the wire and you see a challenge go by and a response go back and you can capture those, again, that's something we can leverage offline attacks against. So things like internet key exchange for IPsec VPN that uses a challenge response. So anytime we see the challenge and the response go by, we can capture it, and we can try cracking it offline. Any questions on these different categories? Hopefully everybody's doing all right. Everybody's pretty quiet today. <clears throat> Just kind of broad categories for right now. But the act of online, again, this is real chatty. This is us trying to run a script, hitting a remote FTP server, remote HTTP server, and just trying to connect again and again and again. They've got these terms here, dictionary. It means we're using a word list, right? What is brute force? It means we're trying every possible combination. Dictionary is quick and easy. Brute force takes forever, 
but it always eventually works because we're trying every possible combination.